This second lecture on music from Central and Eastern Europe features dance music from Poland and Bulgaria. I'm going to use this music to illustrate some more important foundational concepts that are necessary to any sort of comprehensive grasp of music. These concepts will include the difference between relative and parallel keys, and there will be questions about them in the accompanying quiz. Understand that what I'm presenting here is actually far different from the kind of thing that would occupy us if I were teaching a music theory class, but this isn't a music theory class. It's a class in world music, and that means we need to find out how some of the world's music operates. The first music comes from the Podali district of southern Poland in the Tatras Mountains. Those mountains are formidable, and the valleys within them have been somewhat isolated from the cities for generations, so culture has changed more slowly there than it has in, say, Krakow or Warsaw. The music I'm going to play for you comes from a Goralski suite. In music, suite usually means a collection of dances organized in a way that reflects the tastes and expectations of a culture. Dance suites were a regular feature of European popular music from at least the late 17th century on, and each culture's suites contain a different kind of collection from the others. The word Goralski is an adjective indicating music from a mountainous region. A Goralski suite from Podali has five movements, with the first of them being an Ozvodna. An Ozvodna is a fast, duple-time dance intended for just two dancers. You might think of it as a kind of polka. This Ozvodna has a striking sound, and I think you should just hear it first before I say another word about it. <laughs> address two things in this part of the lecture, what this dance music is made of and how the dance is performed. I'm sure you noticed that the music is very repetitious, especially its bass line. That bass line, played on a small three-stringed bass instrument about the size of a cello, consists of only ten notes, all played on beats, with each note repeated. There are only three different pitches in that bass line, and they are all the roots of functional chords in D major. It's impossible to imagine a bass line more rudimentary than this, or more clearly functional. That bass line is so short and repeated so many times that there's an Italian musical term that describes it, ostinato. Ostinato is cognate with the English word obstinate, in other words, repeated ad nauseum. An ostinato is a short melodic or rhythmic pattern that is repeated again and again. If the ostinato lies in the bass line, as this one does, it's called basso ostinato, and that's an important distinction since a repeated bass line has profound harmonic implications. Since the bass line is 10 beats long in fast duple time, that means that the phrases are all five measures long, which is strikingly different from the Yiddish alphabet song Eufen Pripetschik, which I examined in the previous lecture. Four measure phrases have a balanced feel to them, probably because we are, after all, bilaterally symmetrical animals whose equipment and motion tends to come in groups of two. Five measure phrases sound a little unbalanced. They can be divided equally only in the middle of the third measure where no downbeat occurs. Those five measure phrases are organized in groups of three with a pattern roughly of A, B, B. 
I'm going to call those groups cycles, which should be familiar from the previous lecture. Each cycle is 15 measures long, and there are four of them. There is also an introduction that includes some singing. This is the invitation to the dance, sung by the band leader and harmonized by the rest of the players and presented at a slower tempo. When the tempo speeds up, that's where the cycles kick in and the dancing begins. To help you understand what I've just said here, I'm going to play the dance again, this time with a breakdown of its structure. <laughs> fact that the music is in the brighter version of the major mode, known as Lydian, which accounts for some of the band leader's more exotic sounding notes, there's not much more to say about this dance. So now I'll give you an account of how the dancing works. This dance music is likely to be played in someone's living room at the end of the working week when friends get together, have a potluck dinner, drink copious amounts of wine, and dance away the evening. The dancing is itself a formal occasion, but that doesn't mean that people are dressed in formal wear. It simply means that the dancing follows a prescribed form. That's really what formal means. So imagine this scene. A group of friends have gathered at the house of one of them, and some of those friends play instruments. Three of them will do the honors as the band, two violin players and a bossy player. Dinner is over, the living room furniture is moved to one side, the band takes their position against one of the walls and tunes up, and everyone gets ready to dance. In one corner of the room sits a young woman with her chaperone. In the opposing corner sits a young man and his chaperone. The band leader calls the tune, as you heard at the beginning of the recording, and the chaperones escort their charges to the center of the room where they greet each other formally with a bow and a curtsy. Then the tempo quickens and the dance begins. The dance is a short one, and when it's finished, the couple acknowledge each other in the same way they did earlier and are escorted back to their respective corners by their chaperones. Now remember that I said a Goralsky suite has five movements. The first of them is an Osvodna, an example of which you just heard. Now the band prepares to play the second dance in the suite, which is not a Nozvodna, and a second dancing couple, who are seated in the other two corners of the room, are escorted to the center of the room by their chaperones, where they dance the second of the dances in the suite. At the end of that dance, they retire to their corners, and the first couple, who have by now caught their breath, come again to the center of the room and dance the third dance of the suite. That alternation between dance couples continue until the five-movement suite is finished. That means, of course, that couple number one danced three times, while couple number two danced only twice. To rectify that imbalance, the band plays through the entire suite a second time, and this time couple number two danced the opening of Zvodna, with the other couple then dancing the second dance, and so forth. What this means is that by the time the entire cycle has been played twice, both couples have danced a total of five times and have danced each of the movements in the suite. Since the evening's entertainment will undoubtedly include a number of other couples who want to dance, the band will next play a different Goralsky suite, organized the same way but with different music. That kind of alternation continues until the party is over. Want to hear it one more time?
Now let's shift our focus south and east to Bulgaria. I'll present two dances from that country, both played by Vasil Provanov's Horo Orchestra. The first is a Danubian Daichovo Horo. A Horo is a communal dance, often danced in a line. These dances are typically performed on celebratory occasions, such as weddings. The designation Danubian has to do with the region of Bulgaria it comes from, namely along the flood plain of the Danube River, which forms the frontier between Bulgaria to the south and Romania to the north. The Daichovo part of the title refers to a common man's nickname, Daicho, and I don't have an explanation for its appearance in this dance. In all likelihood, it refers to a composer of such music who was so appreciated that his name came to be linked to the style. Before I talk more about it, I want you to hear it. Full disclosure, this is some of my favorite music. Let's begin with its rhythmic profile. Did you notice something a little lopsided about it? I'm not talking about phrasing now, as in the Osvodna we heard earlier. I'm talking about the individual measures. They're basically two beat measures, but the second beat is always a little longer than the first. This introduces a small skip or hiccup into the forward motion. Listen to a little of it again and see if you can detect what I mean.
that rhythmic stumble can be accounted for this way. If you think of these two beat measures as being comprised of eight eighth notes, four of them to a beat, then if you add an eighth note to the second half of the measure, you get exactly that lopsidedness that I've pointed out. In other words, it's a form of 9-8 time, but divided as 4 plus 5. Now I want to tell you about relative and parallel keys, both of which are illustrated very clearly in this dance. Let's start with the definitions. Relative keys are two keys, one major and one minor, which use the same notes but are built on two different tonics. The example in this piece is the keys of D minor and F major. D minor is the majority key of the dance and is established unmistakably in the music's very first phrase. The keys of D minor and F major use the same notes, which is why the same key signature, a single flat sign in this case, is used for both. But the scale of D minor starts on D, resulting in the interval pattern whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, whole, if one starts on D and plays the scale one degree at a time through a full octave. The scale of F major, on the other hand, starts on F, and using the same notes as in D minor, we get the pattern whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. I'm going to play an excerpt from the dance that exhibits both D minor and F major so that you can hear both the differences and the relatedness. I hope that was clear to you. D minor and F major certainly do sound different. After all, one of them is minor in quality and the other is major, but they're not that different since they're using the same notes. I think F major could be described as having a warmer sound than D minor, but the difference is not particularly striking. Now on to parallel keys. Parallel keys are two keys, one major and one minor, which are built on the same tonic pitch. The example in this dance is the difference between D minor and D major, two keys built on the same pitch, D. How do those compare? Well, the key signature for D minor is, as I indicated earlier, a single flat, that is, B flat. So the notes of the D minor scale are D, E, F, G, A, B flat, C, and D at the top. The key signature for D major is two sharps, F sharp and C sharp. That means that the notes of the D major scale are D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, and D. Did you notice how many notes are different? The answer is three. That's three notes out of a diatonic collection of seven notes. Do you remember the definition of a diatonic scale? Three notes out of seven is as close to half the notes as you can get without changing more than half. Do you see how different D minor and D major must sound? The difference is really striking. I'll play you an excerpt where that happens. This slipping from D minor into D major could be called a modal shift, since mode refers to scale quality, such as major or minor. The effect is striking. When the music goes from D minor to D major, it's almost as if the sun comes out. Of course, later, the music will return to D minor, and when that happens, it sounds as though a cloud has once again passed before the sun's face.
Now I want to play the entire dance for you with some formal guidance. I'll be addressing both the dance's formal outline, which is AABCB plus coda, and those excursions into the relative and parallel major keys. Watch carefully and try to relate what you see to what you're hearing. That's all the music for today. Please complete the accompanying quiz and return it to me by Wednesday, April 8th at 5 p.m. your local time. And stay safe and well.